So now I'm going to launch in my talk. And, and I want to apologize to probably 70% of you, because many of you almost have PhDs in neuroendocrine tumors. And I know that many of you have been to these conferences, read a lot about this disease. This is not really for you. This is for the rest of the group who has a rare disease, and they know the diagnosis. They might know a, a 10 top things about their diagnosis, but they keep on hearing about these other terms, and they wonder, well, does that apply to me? So I'm going to try to sort of give you a, a context for how uh, we think about this. The first thing to, to mention is what we're not going to talk about. And so the neuroendocrine is a term that's used throughout medicine. And there's neuroendocrine tumors that are called small cell lung cancer, small cell neuroendocrine. That's not this disease. It's a very different disease. It's a disease that is almost exclusively occurs in heavy smokers. It's a terrible disease, but it's not our neuroendocrine category. Large cell neuroendocrine lung cancer is an entirely different category, also associated with a, a, a relatively fast, aggressive tumor. Again, not our category. Some colon cancers, the pathology report will say adenocarcinoma with neuroendocrine features. That's not this neuroendocrine tumor, OK? That's, that's another standard adenocarcinoma. The good thing about no, most neuroendocrine tumors is that they're not standard adenocarcinoma, where the disease tends to grow faster and, causes, uh, and requires more aggressive chemotherapy, and lives are shorter with adenocarcinomas in general. Uh, but we're not talking about those, those entities. There's another rare appendiceal cancer called goblet cell carcinoid. This is, uh, this is uh, so misleading that we've been trying to get pathology groups to change the name. This is not a carcinoid. This is actually a, a, an adenocarcinoma. It just kind of looks like a carcinoid. So they said, oh, well, it looks like a carcinoid, so we'll call it that. It is not a, not a neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, and then there are other legitimate neuroendocrine tumors that kind of fall outside the purview of our group. And we're, although we're happy to answer questions on them, we're talking about thyroid, adrenal, and pituitary cancers. That's not going to be what we're talking about today. Okay, so these are not on today's subject. And I apologize if any of you are here specifically to hear those. I'm happy to talk with you at any of the breaks if you have these diseases. But most of, almost everything we say today will not apply to these, this group. So let's talk about some of the nomenclature that you hear, you might read on your PATH report, your doctors might talk about. One is the differentiation. That just means how ugly does, this, does a cell look under the microscope. If it's poorly differentiated, it means it's pretty ugly. They're, they're, the cells are not trying to behave in a uniform manner. You have nuclei that are big, nuclei that are small, cells that are big, cells that are small, uh, uh, cells that aren't recognizing each other. It's chaos both at the cellular level and cell-cell interactions. And a pathologist can tell that. So that would be poorly differentiated. Or a synonym for that would be high grade. Poorly differentiated and high grade, that's usually not part of a carcinoid discussion. In fact, one of the errors in using carcinoid, the term carcinoid, is that it should not apply to a poorly differentiated or high grade. There's no such thing as a high grade carcinoid. It should be high grade neuroendocrine, OK? Uh, so most of what we talk about in terms of typical carcinoid would be well-differentiated, well-behaved looking cells, well-ordered cells that look fairly uniform, or low-grade, again, a synonym. So low-grade, well-differentiated, the same. Of course, biology is never black and white, so biology gives us this intermediate area that makes it sometimes difficult to sort out. The poorly differentiated or high-grade neuroendocrine tumors, as I said, they're, they're a distinct group for clinical trials. They're a distinct group for uh, how we treat. But we've started to assume uh, them under our umbrella because nobody else deals with them. So within the uh, neuroendocrine world, we're starting to take charge of these tumors. These are more aggressive behavior, requiring more aggressive chemotherapy treatments. And these are usually not included in, again, typical carcinoid discussions. So how do we classify? neuroendocrine tumors. You can do it by site, by wherever the tumor was thought to have come from, pointing out that sometimes it's unknown. Sometimes we'll find a few spots in the liver, and we'll do a biopsy and we'll say, aha, that's a neuroendocrine tumor, but we don't know where the tumor came from. I think that will be a subject of one of our panel discussions. And uh, an older classification, which you may read about in the old textbooks, is foregut, midgut, hindgut, and, fore and that's just an embryologic 
uh, uh, classification because these were foregut, these were midgut, and uh, rectum and colon were hind, rectum was hindgut. So, um, so those are not typically used anymore, but you'll still see them, uh, you'll still see those terms. Even the term carcinoid tumor, I actually, uh, when I sp spoke with a person who organized, who, who founded Caring for Carcinoid Foundation, I just said, I wish you would come up with a different name. We've been trying to get rid of that term because it can be so confusing. I don't think we're going to be successful because even we use it routinely in the, in the medicine world. But carcinoid is really refers to well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Typically, or the most typical is they have the appendix or small intestine, but it's used for well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors of other sites. So it's not just this site, but it's used for other sites. And as I said, sometimes it's misused. The goblet cell carcinoid is not a carcinoid. A poorly differentiated carcinoid is really not a carcinoid. And it can confuse, the, uh, the pathologist puts that on a report, it can confuse the person who's read it, reading it, and the doctor could give the wrong treatment based on that confusion. Uh, carcinoid syndrome, 90% uh, of you know that, but many who don't have that syndrome wonder what it is or don't have true carcinoid. The symptoms, of course, are facial flushing, diarrhea due to release of small molecules from the tumor into the bloodstream. We can detect some of those molecules. There's serotonin and 10 or 15 others that are detected, and serotonin gets metabolized into something called 5-HIAA. That requires a 24-hour urine collection, and that's a little bit more accurate than the serotonin. So that's why we get urine collections on people who have carcinoid disease or carcinoid syndrome. Islet cell, another old term that's still used periodically, is simply a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas, and it's called that because we think that they derive from the islet cells, which are the cells that make insulin, but other cells don't just make insulin. If they make insulin and they're a tumor, we call it an in insulinoma. If they make gastrin and they're a tumor, we call it a gastrinoma. If they make glucagon and that becomes a tumor, tumor it's a glucagonoma. And if, if something called VIP, this is not a very important person, this is vasoactive intestinal peptide. Uh, if you have that, you have diarrhea, just like you with carcinoid syndrome, and VIPomas. Uh, uh, are what we call the tumor that makes VIP. So you can see that's confusing, hindgut, midgut, foregut, differentiation, carcinoid or neuroendocrine tumor, it gets confusing. This is our preferred terminology. And if I could give every, everyone sort of a one-page description of their disease, the, on, on the very first part of that page it would be degree of differentiation. This is well-differentiated tumor of the ileum or, uh, and associated with carcinoid syndrome. Boom. Now your doctor knows exactly what that disease is. Or if it's a poorly differentiated tumor of the rectum and uh, no syndrome. Okay? So we're trying to make the nomenclature simpler and more accurate. How do these tumors cause problems? Well, they can cause problems because of a mass, just like a regular cancer. The mass can grow and occupy valuable real estate in the liver or elsewhere. The mass can grow and put pressure on the gut or on the stomach and cause GI symptoms as a result. Or the uh, mass, the tumor cells within the mass can release substances, and that we call that a syndrome. And of course, carcinoid syndrome is what we just discussed. Those tumors that are associated with the syndrome are sometimes called functioning tumors. So people ask, well, what's functioning, what's non-functioning? If it's causing a syndrome, that's functioning. If it's not causing a syndrome, it's non-functioning. Simple as that. Um, and more and more these days, you, you've all read about the plethora of CT scans. You, I mean, if you uh, had a bad taco across the street at a, at a restaurant and you had some belly pain, you went to the Stanford ER, you'd probably get a CT scan. And so people are getting too many CT scans, and we all acknowledge that. Uh, and there's a, there's a concern about radiation that may be a topic of discussion further downstream. But, uh, but as a result, we're starting to find neuroendocrine tumors that before they have any symptoms, before there's any secretory symptoms, before there's any mass symptoms. So many of our patients are now being diagnosed by incidental diagnosis. Okay, just a couple words on biology. One is that these tumors are <laughs> unique in that they have receptors on their cell surface called somatostatin receptors. About 80% of neuroendocrine tumors have somatostatin receptors. And these are receptors, there are five of them, five different types. 
and they can be on the cell surface in various concentrations, so some people have more of them than others. And these are the receptors that bind to octreotide. In fact, octreotide is a chemical modification of somatostatin, which you can think of as a hormone. So a hormone comes in, binds to one of these receptors. Binding that receptor does something to the cell. Octreotide binds to some of these receptors and, uh, and specifically the receptors that are most commonly expressed. So that's one biological feature of this tumor. Another is that these tend to be hypervascular. By hypervascular, they have a very rich blood supply. Well, that sounds simple enough, but most tumors don't. This is, on the left, of colon cancer patients. This is a person lying down on the table. Here's a table, and, this, and they're lying down on their back. So this is their backbone, and this is the backbone. This is a slice through the liver, and these dark spots here are typical colorectal cancer metastasis to the liver. They're dark relative to the normal liver. Why are they dark? Because when we give the IV contrast, the, the iodine that we give by IV, it goes everywhere in the body, but you can see that the normal liver has more of the contrast than the tumor does. So the normal liver is getting more blood supply than that tumor, and therefore, uh, they look dark on the scan. There and there. Neuroendocrine tumors, on the other hand, have a more rich vascular supply actually outstripping the adjacent organs. It's not like it's stealing blood from them, but you can see here on this scan, these little white light bulbs just light up like that are brighter than the surrounding liver, and that's a neuroendocrine tumor. Same here, here's a large uh, baseball or, or softball sized mass in the liver that's bright compared with the surrounding liver, and that's another characteristic. So let's talk about blood vessels. How, did, how does that happen? Well, we don't know precisely, but one way that we think it happens is tumor cells. So here's a bunch, clump of tumor cells in a tumor. It can make molecules or growth factors that bind to adjacent blood vessels. These are normal blood vessels, blood vessels that are just nearby. It can bind to a specific receptor on the blood vessel cell, and these molecules are growth factors. They bind to the receptor, and in so doing, they stimulate growth of the blood vessel cell to grow towards the tumor. Kind of a scary thing, isn't it? It can actually tell blood vessels to start feeding it. And one way it does that is by releasing these substances, okay? So there are three pharmacologic strategies for fixing that or addressing that. One is you can take a drug. So here, here's a blood vessel cell in the bottom. These are blood vessel cells. And this is the receptor that sits on the surface of the blood vessel cell. And you could take that molecule that the tumor's making and just take it out of commission by binding to it. So that's what bevacizumab or Avastin does. It takes out the vasculoendothelial growth factor, or VEGF. There are actually molecules in clinical trials that bind to the receptor. None of them are approved yet. And then there's a whole bunch of molecules that bind to this internal domain. So if this is a switch that turns, that's turned on by VEGF to tell the cell to grow, this is like cutting the wiring in that switch. And these are, these are pills, and the first one approved uh, uh, with sunitinib just eight weeks ago for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Serafinib also works and bisopinib also works. So these are ways of inhibiting angiogenesis and trying to address this issue of a rich vasculature. Okay, so how do we take advantage of net biology? Well, with somatostatin receptors, we can use octreotide, link it to some low-dose radiation, and use it to diagnose tumors. So the octreotide scan takes octreotide, puts a little bit of radiation on it, gives it IV, goes everywhere in the body, but tends to get caught up where there are receptors, and so we can see it. We can give octreotide for carcinoid syndrome. One of the functions of those receptors is a secretory receptor. You can just shut that down and you stop secreting, or you decrease the secretion of those uh, uh, serotonin-like molecules. We now know that octreotide can also stunt the growth it doesn't shrink the tumor necessarily, but it can slow the growth of these tumors. And then PRT, which we'll learn about a little bit later, uh, is, uh, is taking the same octreotide and linking something very hot to it, and linking something very hot to it, hand delivers something that's radiation, that, that's a lethal radiation right to the tumor cell. We take advantage of hypervascularity, 
in the liver by, by attacking the liver artery specifically and either delivering chemo through the liver artery that John Louis will talk about later, uh, radioembolization and, and infusing radioactive beads directly through the liver to the tumors, and then angiogenesis inhibitors, as I mentioned. 